just where we're coming from in our disciplines. In your own field, has there been any significant, significantly new knowledge produced in the last 10 or 15 years? In recent 20 years, in at least three fields connected with my field, country research. First, a new semi, a new uh, quasi discipline emerged that's called cultural psychology. A large group of psychologists finally recognized that the psyche is not something that dwells in the head only or in the nervous system but is something that is the result of uh, socio-cultural uh, parameters. So even the self, even the self is no longer an isolated psyche. That has been a major, a major change in the view, not yet accepted by many departments of psychology all around the world, but if you are interested in this field, you can already have a 1,000 pages handbook of cultural psychology published a few years ago with this summarizing very well the uh, achievements of the field. That's one. Second field has been um, uh, all sorts of ramifications of economic studies. Uh, thanks to Pierre Bourdieu, we have a different view of economy. Someone has given it the name Bourdieu Economics to honor his name, that is including parameters of culture within economy, understanding that economy as the uh, Marxist model and, and um, all the development that came from it uh, are no longer tenable to understand the economy and therefore in business management, in the abundance of economy, in uh, people studying globalization, commercial interactions. It all started with a fellow whom I mentioned this morning, uh, Gerd Hofstede in Holland, who was an engineer and who was faced with the uh, impossibility to communicate between various societies and uh, since then we have more and more work you have seen the group sitting here has seen the reader I, I, I accumulated of over 1000 pages about cultural competence much of it is innovative in the sense that these perspectives were not part of the classical literature about intercultural relations because it has to do very much with acculturation, immigration, intercultural relations at large and so on. And the third field where you have, in my mind, the most exciting development, most exciting development is the field of cultural evolution, um, promoted, developed by a group or several groups of biologists. So it's in biology. It does not study only human beings. It began with the study of other animals, claiming that without culture, those animals will not, would not survive. Many animal, animals can survive with the help of their genes, but other animals cannot survive without learning from each other, each generation teaching the younger generation what to do. That is, where you get your food, how you get your food, whom you mate, and so on and so on. And uh, the group, since in, it's in only in the last decade, the number of studies in this direction has been so overwhelming. People in London, the University of London, University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and the University of, Sc of Stockholm, few people in Italy, one in Vancouver. This is the international group of biologists. And one of them, Alex Mesudi, from Professor Mesudi from the University of London, in one of his papers, where he 
preaches the necessity to establish a new science of culture. He is not even hesitant to use the name, the word science of culture that many humanists didn't like at all. He says the failure of sociology, anthropology, the social sciences at large is that they do not talk to one another. While we biologists have been speaking to one another for the last 100 years, learn from one another, and so he wants to throw to the garbage can everything that has been written about culture in the, within the framework of the humanities and the social sciences and begin from scratch. But Good. much of the work is highly innovative. My problem, sorry, with the people you mentioned, with Bourdieu, Osteda, Mesudi, whom I've read, so I won't comment, uh, is the supposition that a culture is systemic. No. And no, you can, it is, it certainly no. is. You know, Hofstede, you go and get your parameters for these oh, different yes. things and that's your culture. A Bourdieu supposition that the field is entirely determined. Yes, but in think France, behind that. Behind we that. have to go beyond that a beyond, lot, I beyond, think, beyond. to get to the very frag sure. culturally fragmented sure. communities okay. that we are developing, okay. not just in okay. Europe. Let me, let me and that speak. means going beyond those Yes. Parent discoveries okay. and the systemic nature that un underlies the biological metaphor as well. Let me, let me. Uh, when I mentioned Hofstede, I didn't mean to say that we have to accept Hofstede's theory as is. I said that Hofstede started a movement, started a motion, started something new. Now, the biologists, true, they work within the framework of uh, theory of evolution. I don't know whether anyone has um, suggested uh, so far a better theory to deal with the uh, nature of uh, living creatures, but the innovation is that they manage to, in a way, to focus our attention on the fact that culture is not something that goes beside life. That is, that first you have culture, and then you have some sort of culture. In their view, in their view, culture is a condition for life to exist. So in many ways, they are more courageous than anthropologists and sociologists who have been uh, talking about cultures for the last 150 years. You see, they say, no life without culture. And as a result, they define culture, and to me this definition is highly acceptable because it allows for so many perspectives. Culture is the stock of the repertoire of solutions that is passed from one generation to another through learning. Through learning. So people learn, animals learn from one another, what they call social learning, which is the most economical, and therefore this allows them to survive, survive in a sense, find food, find mates, organize life, understand what's going about in life. And of course, in human societies, it gets more and more complex. In some animal societies, um, the culture is not as complex. But this is an innovation conceptually because they give you a completely new and different basis for conceptualizing about culture. You don't have to apologize anymore if you wish to um, deal with culture and you don't have to legitimize uh, your interest in culture. Here you have a very solid and strong basis telling you culture is a condition of life. It's not just a result. It's not a superstructure as in Marxism. Mm -hmm. I, I think this has been the most exciting innovation in recent 20 years. Uh, one form of cultural evolution um, is, of course, mimetics. Yes. And um, I found this very exciting about 15 years ago. And together with Femir, funnily enough, whom I talked about the other day, um, um, we, we both introduced mimetics into translation studies in the late 1990s. Can you explain what that is? Um, okay, well, um, um, a meme is a word that was introduced by, by Dawkins in, in his book The Selfish Gene, 
back in the 1970s um, to be the cultural equivalent of a gene. So a meme is any kind of idea that replicates itself and gets passed on and people learn. Such as, uh, how, do we, how, do, how, do we, how do we make warm clothes? Oh look, the Eskimos there down the road, they make warm clothes out of seal skins. Um, they use special bananas for the zips or whatever it is that they have. And uh, let's copy that and see if we can make similar clothes. Um, or think of uh, whoever it was who first invented the idea of an arch. Yes. The Romans or whoever it was before that. I mean, that's not an obvious idea. And as soon as one culture notices, hey guys, we can build arches, and then it kind of spreads around, we get different kinds of arches, and so on. So these are ideas that get passed along from one culture to another. Okay. Ferrer and I were not working with each other at that point, and we didn't know that we were both interested in the same idea, but in the same year, or within a year, we had both published work um, suggesting that memetics would be a very fruitful framework for translation studies, because translations are as I said at the beginning of my own book, they are um, vehicles by which memes are carried from one culture to another. Translations are carriers of ideas, you might say, and they get replicated and copied and so on. And what has been, for me, <coughs> pessimistic in a way, is that uh, very few scholars within translation studies in the last 12 years have actually taken up that. It hasn't seemed to have been a very fruitful development within translation studies. Perhaps one reason for this would be that if you look at the history of memetics as a particular branch of cultural evolution, uh, it's also come in for a great deal of criticism within, but by other cultural critics, cultural yeah, scholars. Sure. And so it's not been by any means universally accepted as the way to go mm -hmm. in, in uh, cultural evolution. But it still seems to me to offer quite a productive conceptual framework for thinking about the cultural role of translation and other ways by which ideas get passed on in society. The, the notion of the meme in itself, seeing that still seems to be terribly essentialist, idealistic, the problem is what do you identify as being a meme? And you're ultimately brought back to the classical problems of equivalence. I think that, that there's a very fundamental problem there with um, with what I'm calling indeterminacy in our theorization. It seemed very essentialist and idealist. Uh, That's one of the forth. criticisms that yeah. was made of it, certainly. And then and indeed were others. But an idea can still be found to be useful, even though there has been some criticism. But if the criticism begins to be overwhelming, then the idea just gets dropped and we move on to something else. I mean, that is in itself cultural evolution. Can, can I move the discussion forward? Um, is it true in your disciplines, respectively, just as a starting point, that ideas and methods, ideas, means, have moved from the West and have been globalized? That, that we have lived through in the 20th century a, a, a massive movement from the West to the rest of the world without any real return, without ideas coming from beyond the West uh, being picked up and used within the West, wherever that may be. Much came from China, but then, since the 18th century, science has been basically produced in, in the West. That's, uh, that's, uh, you can't, you can't uh, turn your, your, your face from that, and uh, everybody else adopted that. Now, Japanese, Chinese mathematicians do contribute to mathematics and physics nowadays. You can't open a journal, any learner journal in mathematics, physics, biology, cultural psychology with Kitayama uh, without uh, having Japanese, Chinese, uh, Malaysians uh, and other people considered to be Eastern belonging and Indians of course so that uh, I don't know, science uh, was developed in the West, but the rest of the world participates rather overwhelmingly in recent decades at least. The, the sense of my question is that in our research, in our own disciplines, because of the sort of thing you're describing, we don't have to confront a radically cross-cultural situation. We seem to avoid that 
In what because sense? the discourse is the discourse of science yes. or of the humanities yes. all over the world. True. Okay. I don't know if that's true in linguistics. I assume it is, and and in Thank translation you. studies or anything else. We we have calls at the moment for non-Western translation studies. And that's where I'm getting to. Do we want to well, entertain support, yeah. Andrew? I think uh, the broad answer to the question about whether ideas from the West are spreading out in, throughout the world and rather than vice versa is yes, I agree. Um, uh, but what interests me is why. And um, one could think of um, at least two typical characteristics of, of the way in which thought has developed in the West, which has given it the edge over the way in which thinking patterns and thinking behavior has perhaps developed elsewhere. And one is uh, the importance of asking questions, quite simply. I learned this recently this year that there are languages, for example in Australia, where there are certain sorts of questions the grammar doesn't allow you to ask. You simply cannot ask a direct question at all. Then there's no structure which allows you to do it, certain sorts of questions. And that must be an enormous obstacle to any kind of intellectual curiosity. Um, and I think as long as people ask questions, and as long as the society is such that questions can be asked, questions are not banned, there's always the possibility of inquiring and querying and so on, then things move forward. But as soon as you're not allowed to ask questions, or questions are not encouraged, or you are imprisoned if you ask questions, then everything gets stuck. And this connects to the second line, the second characteristic, which seems to me to be very critical for Western thought, is simply the ability to criticize, um, which includes not just the freedom to criticize others, without which science would be dead, if we don't permit ourselves the right to criticize other hypotheses, and if we don't also have some self-criticism, then we are dead ourselves, if we never can learn from criticism some directed at us. So any kind of culture that simply denies rights to criticize or denies self-criticism is going to get stuck. This, um, if there are non-Western uh, approaches and questions that can be asked, um, great, let's, let's, uh, let's see them. But, but um, I haven't been overwhelmed with non-Western type questions. I don't know. I mean, have you? I mean, can we come? Can we have some examples of, of, of methods or questions that would be somehow very different from those questions which have been asked in the West? Questions about translation. Questions about culture. Are they radically different? I would rather think of all the societies where where one, one should not ask questions, where disagreement is punishable by prison or... And they're inferior prison. societies, aren't they? Aren't they? Um, I think they are societies, but if they don't, if they don't encourage criticism um, and questioning, then they're probably not going to develop as richly as a culture where this would be the case. There is evidence to show this, surely. That's getting to it because there are many, many cultures based on consensus rather than opposition. Consensus that would doesn't not do what we're most, doing now. Consensus doesn't exclude in Japanese the right society. To nobody cut me off when I was speaking, and I'm going to do. I feel free to interrupt you. You see, you now see. In the West. but that's our rationality, and there are many, many societies that value consensus. I don't think it's got anything to do with rationality. I think we could, there's a debate. Way of organizing the discourse of knowledge. How okay. does that sound? Oh, that's rather better. Good. And we've got one way of doing it. And are we really in the business of imposing that on the rest of the world? It, it, and I suspect we are. Uh,